relatively common pattern. And then I have two examples of uh, from the prompt ex ex itself. The big fancy one, Charlie, too fancy is, but I really do remember around college graduation about 100 years ago thinking, um, oh, you could pick an off-the-shelf life, go do this thing, get a job, follow a normal career path, or do something else. So as I say, a little bit fancy, but I sort of feel like um, at that point I chose to to do an uh, not do an on-the-shelf life, and I've been making one up ever since. And then a really specific um, example was one of my first jobs in the real world. The I was there a lot after hours, and one time I, um, I, I, I went into the accountant, the bookkeeper's office, and viewed the executable of the, I was enough of a nerd I could view the executable, and her password just shone out at me as in plain text. And so I logged in and looked at what everybody was getting made. So this is 100 years ago. I don't do things like that ever since. But I'm really glad I did it once. It felt very, of course, clever and transgressive. And I get the appeal of that. So um, I like that our Nakatomi space came up again. I really like the paragraph about um, the financial markets are totally based on I made a note, the uh, people reading careful contractual minutia or, um, and, and making money at it. And then finally, I just really like that the pointing out puns are part of this as well. So uh, Mayor, on to you. Those were my, my sets of top level points. Yeah, thank you. So uh, my father told me that when he was uh, young, okay, so that's many years ago, when you wanted to go across the border into Canada, the guardsmen would just listen to your accent. And if you had a New York accent, they knew you were American and let you in. You didn't even have to show a passport, and there was no question. But I, I wrote in the discussion two uh, similar stories. Um, when I was um, 18, I took a long bike ride to visit somebody at an army base. And when I got there, I realized I didn't have any ID papers, so they'd never let me in. So I went up and asked if I could go in for a drink of water. They said yes, and then I continued on. And because it's one of those bases where you have uh, people um, living, I'm assuming they thought I was just somebody's kid and not, um, I actually was a soldier at the time. Um, so that's one story. And another one is my wife's grandmother. So to make a long story short, the Gestapo took her husband's passport and were, he was a wanted man. But in those days, the kids were in the passport either of the father or the mother, in this case, the father. And she needed to leave Germany, but she couldn't take her kids with her. They had no passport. And in those days, in that part of Germany, you could get a day pass to go to the beach in Belgium. So she took an old expired day pass on Easter Sunday with her kids and just, you know, a picnic basket. And uh, she got on the train and at the border, the Nazi border guard says, where are you going? So she said, I'm supposed to meet my husband on the beach. And he said, but uh, this permit is expired. And she started saying, oh, my God, and my kids and my husband and so on. He said, fine, you can go out, but promise you're coming back today. And, well, she didn't. So, so I think uh, these are uh, examples where you were maintenance overall and uh, seemed to fit the parts. And it just worked. But the real question, I think, when I read uh, the article is, are we capable of unseeing? Um, yeah, I'm sure all of us have toys. But um, how often should we be doing it on a daily basis? Once a day, once a week, once an hour? So I think it's nice that we can identify examples, but I don't know if we are anywhere close to that ability. Those of us that are not, you know, hackers. Um, on to you, uh, Benny. 
Yeah. <coughs> hey. Um, <coughs> this is really good food. Guess, uh, two, <coughs> sorry. Uh, I have two examples, I guess. One is um, this, uh, um, there's this story in a podcast uh, that I really like and was about like the origin of um, skateboarding and like the skate parks that are sort of like shaped like, you know, a kidney and like nice round um, edges and stuff like that. Um, so apparently, um, skate, like it started with uh, like the Calif South, Southern California drought in the 1980s and um, LA uh, had like LA suburbs had these pools in people's backyards uh, that were dry at the time. And these pools were designed um, by this one particular guy and he, all of his pools had the same design of like basically sort of like undulated curves instead of like sharp edges. Uh, so they looked like modern skate parks. And basically since the pools were empty, the uh, skater, like skater kids started using them uh, as to, to skate since it provided, it, it was like the perfect surface for uh, skating. And then the design of skate parks was based on the design of that pool. Um, and now all like skate parks everywhere are designed uh, just like that. But it started with that uh, particular design of pool and the Southern California drought and pools being empty. Uh, um, so um, that that's an interesting one. And the other one is, I think, um, like on a much bigger, like sort of bigger scale, like um, the company um, uh, Reliant, which is like you know, um, in India, uh, like I think it was in the news a couple of years back, uh, uh, with they launched this thing called Reliance Geo, which was a five G network across the country, and it was uh, it was free to a certain extent uh, for a lot of people and. So the history of Reliance is basically um, sort of like finding um, sort of like social engineering hacks or like essentially finding ways in which uh, um, finding ways in which government regulation did not uh, actually sort of like match with uh, reality in some way and then manipulating that. Um, and, and so I think, I don't remember the exact example. So I think one was, uh, Reliance started with uh, manufacturing floats, uh, and there was this sort of like import uh, restrictions in India, in, uh, where you can only import as much. Like <clears throat> um, you have to export things, and you can only ex import the amount that is equal to the amount you import. And uh, so, what the Reliance guy did was um, like. Sachin, we can't hear you. You um, cut out about 20 seconds ago. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can uh, hear you now. Uh, I think the last thing I heard you say was uh, the Reliance guys had to um, sell as much in export as they imported, and then you were going to give an example, I think. So continue. Yeah, yeah. So it was. Um, I think uh, basically uh, nylon and uh, polyester. So polyester was uh, very expensive when locally sourced in India than when imported. Uh, and uh, so, so they made, they, they did this thing where basically they made the polyester clothes in India and then instead of like selling it in India, they exported it and sold those abroad. abroad uh, and uh, imported uh, um, and, and then imported like the cheaper things from abroad to sell it at home. Um, so basically using, um, yeah, basically sort of seeing through how government regulations uh, does not match uh, like how actual things may operate or like seeing arbitrage or opportunities and that. And I think, um, I, and I, I've been thinking about how like, and maybe it's not always sort of, purposeful, but I feel like all like big businesses that sort of like become unicorn businesses in some ways are sort of like uh, exploiting some sort of 
like a loop like this where the, the government regulation has not quite caught up or there are some like basically the math is not the territory being used by a smart entrepreneur. Uh, I think like Uber is a Uber maybe a good example of like basically um, somebody had a tweet that was like uh, what Uber proved was that uh, your government like local level regulations move much slower than the way than the rate at which Uber can break laws. And I think that's kind of true. Like that that's basically part of the reason why they were able to scale so fast and even though they had like local problems here and there it didn't like it didn't affect uh, it in the uh, like larger run anyway so yeah those are my thoughts uh thank you okay yeah so uh, i was thinking about what uh, mayor just said about uh, all of us have like these little stories but can we or should we do it systematically? So uh, I was actually thinking of examples that are, uh, yes, they're social, but they're not in the sort of hacking kind of uh, uh, level, uh, but they are uh, systematic. And uh, the examples I'm thinking of are like um, how they try to teach you um, design engineering and uh, mechanical engineering. So uh, I remember, for example, in our machine design course, one of the first exercises the professor asked us to do was uh, just brainstorm like 20 users for a pencil. And it turns out that uh, for the first few, you'll kind of be uh, sort of uh, what's known as functional fixedness in psychology. You'll be sort of uh, mentally constrained by your fixed notion that pencils are meant for writing. Uh, and you'll um, say things like, you know, writing, drawing, things like that. And then at some point you start unseeing the abstraction that a pencil is a writing instrument and you start seeing it, for example, it can support things. Uh, it can be used to stab people as a weapon. Uh, you can sharpen both ends and then it becomes a graphite rod that can be used as a radio receiver. So somewhere around the 10 ideas mark, your sort of functional fixedness breaks and you start thinking of ideas where you've completely unseen the function of the pencil as a writing instrument. And that lesson really sort of uh, stuck in my head. And uh, at least when I'm doing like physical things, uh, I think it's become a systematic habit. So I'll give you a couple of examples at the most basic levels I can think of, which are uh, time and space. So space first. So when I first started uh, 3D printing, uh, I realized that I was unconsciously uh, thinking of the dimensions of my printing build board, as it's called, uh, which is, I think, um, uh, 120 millimeter by 120 millimeter, it's a square. And uh, since I was often printing designs that also had somewhat rectangular or square geometries, uh, I was like very unconsciously and stupidly thinking that the largest thing I could print would have a dimension of 120 millimeters. And then at some point it struck me that that's because I have this abstraction of a grid in my head because so many human environments have like rectangular uh, objects and like right angles and uh, our tendency is to line them up along a rectangular grid. Like, you know, if you go into somebody's living room, it's probably rectangular and the sofas and coffee tables are probably lined up along, uh, you know, parallel to the wall. So you get into this habit of like seeing the grid abstraction as being more real than it is. And of course, it's like very trivial to see that if you're willing to like turn it along a diagonal, you can actually get uh, longer dimensions. So once I saw that, um, it, it became like systematic unseen for me. Like now when I look at a design that I might want to print on my 3D printer, I know that actually the effective constraint on um, the length of the thing I can print is, uh, you know, um, square root of two times um, 120 millimeters. So more like 160 millimeter or something like that. Of course, it has to be long and skinny so I can print like a stick that's uh, about 160 millimeters across the diagonal. Uh, so that's an example in uh, space. And you can see this like, you know, when you're moving furniture, when you're arranging things, when you're trying to move a complicated thing through a doorway, often tilting it away from a right angle um, or a rectangular parallel alignment gets you uh, solving the problem. And uh, this is kind of like a common hack in um, manipulating physical objects. In time, something similar happens with like things like um, delays and breaks. Uh, so if you've been in enough meetings, organized enough events, you realize that people have this abstraction of what they think of as a conversation. 
So it's like, all right, there is a topic, people are talking about it, people are taking turns, they're making points, they're having arguments. Uh, they think of it at that level. But then when you think about like the physical process of having a conversation, you realize it's people speaking around the constraints of their voice. Some people might have a sore throat. Some people might have like strong or weak voices. Uh, so for example, if somebody who's soft-spoken and doesn't have, you know, um, practice at like projecting their voice across a room will end up being like a slightly softer kind of small group speaker and they're more likely to do sidebars with people next to them. So seating arrangement matters in controlling the flow of the conversation. Uh, breaks matter a lot. So if you pause a lot while speaking, you will control the conversation a lot more differently than if you speak very rapidly with uh, no pause. Uh, if you like, uh, if you think somebody is going to dominate the room uh, too much, one of the silliest and most effective tricks is to schedule enough breaks in between for like bathroom breaks and so forth. And then you kind of like break up the flow of people who uh, tend to dominate uh, the conversation. So these are all, I think, uh, breaking up the abstraction of a conversation at uh, the biological level, especially using time. So like breaks, pauses, spatial arrangement uh, that control the projection of sound and so forth. Uh, and so th those are the examples I thought of. Uh, I also thought of one example similar to Sachin's, which is uh, there's this um, uh, startup, uh, it's no longer a startup, uh, a healthcare company called Zenefits in the US. And it's basically a SaaS application that allows uh, especially small businesses to administer health insurance plans for their um, employees. And it turns out that the whole business model has nothing to do with like uh, providing health insurance plans and taking a little commission. Like you would expect like, you know, that they probably sell health insurance plans and take a little commission. That's not what was going on, at least initially. It turns out that uh, according to the laws of many states, only humans could like uh, underwrite uh, uh, insurance policies or something. And there's like some regulation of like how often they had to do some verification procedure bureaucratically and they would get paid $500 each time they did that. And the only thing required to do, to be eligible to do that human signing step was um, uh, taking some sort of course that was very trivial so they did something, and I don't remember the exact details, but they did something where they automated the whole thing so that it took like just a few seconds, kind of hacked it so most of their employees kind of um, passed the test or whatever. And each time this very trivial regulation related transaction was done in the insurance system, they would make 500 bucks. So that was their business model, literally just getting paid 500 bucks by the sort of regulatory apparatus uh, for something where the social abstraction was the assumption that a human insurance broker would be the entity doing that step in the bureaucratic process. So they broke that abstraction. They unsaw the abstraction there. Um, yeah, and I think that there's something interesting here where if you go from like the lowest abstraction level, like time and space control, to slightly more social things like what clothing you wear as a maintenance person, to things like, you know, question the assumptions underlying the design of bureaucratic processes, uh, it starts to get very, I don't know, nebulous. And by the time you're at the level of like arbitrage uh, in business models, uh, uh, it's, I'm not sure I would still call it in the realm of uh, unseen abstractions. But yeah, there's definitely something there. And I think it's possible to systematically cultivate at least at the lowest levels like time, space, uh, flow of energy, how far sound travels, that kind of very biological effects of human uh, uh, bodies, basically. All right. All right, so that's it for me. And going back around to Anuraj. Yeah, I couldn't read it, so I have not much to say. I'll pass it on to Ben. Okay, Ben's already been, so... Um, I think Gregory also said he hasn't had time to read, so, so listen only. So floor is open for anybody else who needs um, or has stuff to say. Okay, I'm curious about the Zenovitz example. Uh, where it did, you know, I think there's this broad spectrum be, be, uh, from obviously uh, malign intent, bad rule breaking type of stuff versus, um, hey, it's fine, it's cool, that was clever. 
So there's a broad thing there. Where do you put Zenefits? If, if I'm being clear, where would you put Zenefits on that spectrum? I think it is a valid uh, regulatory act. That process didn't need to be that complex. It was basically um, um, government regulatory process that was captured by the special interest group in this case, which was like, you know, insurance brokers trying to like set up like a cushy revenue stream for themselves. So you, you see this all over the place where regulations that look like they're about protecting the consumer or blah, 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 are really about protecting an industry and it's uh, sort of easy profits. And uh, anytime you see that and can hack that, I'm kind of all for it. So I, I would put this on sort of the, um, not in the, uh, within the letter of the law, but uh, morally righteous because the spirit of the law was basically bad faith capture of uh, something that didn't need to be complex. Do, do we know about it? Because it was eventually kind of exposed and the government official types finally caught up and rewrote that rule? I think so. I haven't yet caught up with what, how mm -hmm. that example actually unfolded. But yeah, I think they closed that loophole and it uh, uh, became more of an actual health insurance broker company. But they had other problems and stuff. So uh, I think one of the uh, broader issues with uh, doing this sort of thing is if you get into the habit of doing this, you develop kind of like, I don't know, bad bad habits, uh, like you start being that sort of low level cunning type of person who's always looking for this kind of exploit. And once people close all the loopholes and you have to kind of make a more honest living that's not based on like clever hacks, you kind of struggle because you've spent all your life uh, doing this kind of thing. And I, I, I suspect this is a failure mode of companies that start with like regulatory hacking or regulatory arbitrage. Uh, where they never actually develop the muscle memory and creativity and building ability to do real things. They're, they're, uh, honestly, I think Trump's business empire is an example. Like there's nothing real there ever. It's entirely based on litigation and like uh, charismatic brand appeal, which is part of the reason it's like, I don't know. It, there, there's nothing there really. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, I guess I'm veering into my ideological opinions there. Well, no, I like that. I think there's like some, I think they call it moral hazard. Fine, go be clever in the devious way if you want to, but it, it's not going to be good for you long term. Oh, I think moral yeah. hazard refers to something else, but yeah, I get what you're saying. It's, yeah. it's kind of like, I would call it something like, I don't know, existential hazard. It's a, it's a weak version of selling your soul to the devil. When you get into the habit of like cheap, easy hacks as your way to do things, yeah, it, it sort of rots your soul in some way and you pay the cost at some point. Yep. Thanks. Well, they, they had this example of the electric uh, truck company that filmed the truck going downhill, apparently, at 40 miles an hour. I forget the name. Nicola. Yeah, that was Nicola. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. Ridiculous. So, so that's what they did, because everybody know, or uh, Savannah, everybody knows that whatever a startup company tells you, it's somewhere between wishful thinking and a uh, stretch goal. But people still believe it and still invest in it. And then somebody stretches it a little bit more, and then you say, oh my God, they cheated us. But it looked like a real movie. All the words were true. In other words, it was a truck. It was going at um, 40 miles an hour on that road. Um, it wasn't using any gasoline or diesel. You know? So at some point, you, you just get to downright lies. So there's a difference, I guess, between hacking a system and hacking people. When you walk into a, a NSA, place without your badge because you were wearing maintenance clothes and held a DHL package in your hand. There's no particular person that is going to tell you, you lied to us. The NSA will tell us that anyways, no matter what. But when you do it to investors, they're going to say you cheated us. And then we get into a discussion, did I lie more than was expected? 
so I, I'm not sure if, if um, these things, you know, where uh, hard ear business empires built on uh, making an impression on people and other people being scared, uh, whether that falls under what we're talking about, which is unseeing things. I think it's exactly the opposite. We see that people are moved by authority, by show, by shiny objects, and we're using them. But somehow it seems different to me. The idea I just thought of is that when you fall back on this sort of manipulative um, level, you're actually just falling back into another abstraction and system where people are uh, NPCs and you can just, uh, you know, press button, get reward. But that is in and of itself another system that you're falling back into, another abstraction of, of people. Um, so instead of like, breaking free, you're actually this sort of sinking deeper. Yeah, I think one of the biggest abstractions involved in that kind of example and also what Maya talked about is this abstraction of uh, long-term relationships um, with like indefinitely extended trust. Like for example, why do we give startups the benefit of the doubt for somewhere between uh, uh, wishful thinking, as uh, Maya put it, wishful thinking and uh, I forget the other term you use, but that spectrum That's where we give them the benefit of uh, we give them the benefit of the doubt because we know innovation is risky that uh, sometimes you have to make uh, promises both to like keep yourself optimistic and sort of like paint the vision blah 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 so we give them the benefit of the doubt uh, when we sense that uh, two things are true one there's actually something there where there's a hard problem and you kind of have to give people room to explore it and that um, they are sort of working at the same level of long-term abstract trust with you and i think examples where people very clearly fall on the side of, yeah, this was fraud. Like, you know, Nicola and uh, Theranos, <clears throat> those are not like gray area cases. They're black and white cases where you ask 100 people in tech and innovation, all 100 will say that's a fraud. And that's because they clearly exploited that benefit of doubt by not doing the main thing the benefit of doubt was about, which was solve the problem, right? the electric transmission or like microfluidic uh, tests. They spent, they uh, used up all the benefit of doubt, like putting on a show and raising money. They didn't actually solve the main thing. So I think that um, there is, it's it's less gray than people think. And I'm trying to think of a good gray example and the um, two I'm thinking of, one was uh, Juicero. So Juicero was that like over-engineered, really expensive juice machine. And it became like this uh, meme startup. I, mean, I think it cost 600 bucks or something. And it was like this extremely over-engineered press that would take like uh, uh, sealed bags of like fruit pulp and squeeze it into juice or something like that. And uh, some uh, teardown person opened up the device and um, showed that you could just squeeze it with your hand. So literally it was a $600 machine that was about like squeezing a bag. Uh, but that, uh, nobody thought of it as fraud. They just thought of it as like really poor design intuitions and bad business thinking. So it was like uh, somebody who was like so in love with uh, beautiful Apple style design that they didn't stop to think whether this was actually a good way to solve the underlying problem. So that I would call genuine gray area. And um, a couple of other things that are somewhere on the spectrum, there was uh, this app called Yo. This was about 10 years ago, I think. It was like a Twitter-like app, but you could only send one message on it called Yo. And uh, I think um, people tried to make, um, I don't know, rationalize it saying things like, it's like a missed call. Back when calls were like expensive and you would send missed calls to uh, let people know, like, you know, one, uh, one bit signals. Um, uh, but ultimately it turned out like, uh, yeah, there was, there's no there there. There's uh, no product to be built um, there. Uh, but in that sort of exuberant mood of like anything is possible and really weird ideas can work, people kind of believed it for a while. So I wouldn't call that one fraud. It was like too much towards the side of uh, wishful thinking. So there's, there's lots of examples throughout the spectrum in Silicon Valley. Uh, but yeah, the social abstraction underlying it is I think two dimensional. One is 
the abstraction you place on the trust relationship. And the second abstraction is um, something around like, I don't know, an unspoken agreement about what the benefit of doubt is being allocated to. Like uh, the sort of unspoken agreement that, hey, we are in a contract for you to build an electric truck. That's the contract, even if you don't actually say so. I think we're yeah. moving oh, yeah. away from the general question of uh, abstractions that they uh, rule our lives. And uh, are we able to willfully um, ignore any particular abstraction? I mean, first recognize that it's there, abstractions or assumptions, and then ignore them or use the second one. And that, that's more general than the subject of distributed systems. But if we limit it to distributed systems, we can ask when we design or control a distributed systems, are we able to identify the abstractions that interfere with us getting to our goal and then breaking them at will? So I agree there's a moral aspect and, and a lot of other aspects, but I, I think it would be more productive if we, if we focused on a particular field like distributed systems we could get more meaning to uh, this issue of uh, unseeing abstractions i think the two are related like if you think about like what is the underlying abstraction that's being unseen in something like say the theranos case like forget about all the moral um, spectrum stuff um, the abstraction is, uh, I would say, the shared vibe in a pitch meeting. So there's a room full of people. One person is telling an excited story with a particular affect and like projecting a certain, you know, sense of confidence, honesty, excitement, and all that. There's like a vibe that goes on in pitch meetings uh, that's kind of very predictable from what I've seen. And there's like a participatory ritual where other people kind of like demonstrate their participation in that vibe. Um, like, you know, by nodding their head, agreeing with certain points, building on each other's points. So there's like a whole, it's not an abstraction in the sense of like, you know, hard edged engineering or math abstractions. It's more of an emotional abstraction where you know, people believe that at a particular level, a certain emotional truth is being enacted. Like this is like the abstraction is something like this wide represents an honest sentiment that's a consensus in this distributed system of eight so, uh, people talking about electric trucks something like that fake pattern recognition is what you're saying yep. right so it's like a fake pattern recognition yep so uh, we can think of different types of abstractions there's like the hard edge organizational abstractions like you know uniforms badges boundary controls uh, checkpoints things like that that's one class of abstractions that can be unseen another class of abstractions that can be seen is um, vibes moods uh, general emotional affects that control a large group like the fire festival that was a big abstraction of like music festivals that was completely unseen and turned into like a, a basically a messy exploit by a event organizer um, and a third class, I think, is like conceptual metaphors. So if you're all talking about like uh, something like a discord where uh, you, you use the word community a lot and you're like implicitly invoking all these abstractions of community, like uh, houses, families, things like that, you're implicitly invoking that, that you can unsee that abstraction. And for example, I've done that. Like uh, when I said something like, I don't like communities, I like airports, I was like, uh, unseeing one abstraction and installing another and it proved helpful for a particular conversation so th i would say those are the three major classes i don't i can't think of any others um, yeah. the formal organizational ones the emotional vibe like ones and then the conceptual metaphor ones those are like three large classes of abstractions you can unsee so let me tell you a story and, and tell me which class it falls into 
so I was, it was a piece of software that people were developing and it was, you know, falling behind like software often does. And um, all the people in the division was a big, you know, uh, CDR of some kind. And people were talking about it and saying, oh, we have to do this step and we'll do that, that step and here's the schedule. And then one guy stood up and said, you expect to have it by such and such a date? That would be a Christmas miracle if you actually managed. And then the discussion abruptly turned into, yeah, building our own database from scratch is maybe not a good idea if we can use Informix. So th there was some sort of shared metaphor, and then suddenly somebody broke that abstraction using a, a fact, and then the new abstraction or, or frame caught on. So which category does this story fit into? Yeah, I'll have to think about that. I think multiple things were going on there, including like uh, formal abstractions where people might have been miscalibrated on the scope of a technology project, um, a conceptual metaphor of like, does this belong in the class of Christmas miracles or like routine well-scoped tasks, things like that. So yeah. Um, I, I think these categories can perhaps mix a lot and, and why, like, you know, extreme confidence turning into doubt and uncertainty about whether a certain thing is feasible or not. That's sort of a wide shift. So all three seem to be present in this example. So maybe the three I mentioned are more like uh, eigen abstractions and things are like uh, some sort of combination of the three in uh, practice mostly. And I jump in just to sort of if if I t think of what my own takeaways are is the habit of mind, like your original orig uh, engineering professor with the pencil, th that's a good habit of mind to be aware of and to look for in yourself. And then when we're designing systems, for the back to what this group is kind of doing, um, how do we build in a system room for freedom, but not too much, right? Like some looking for where the end runners are going to ruin the system. We've talked about all kinds of things around that, but is that a, is that a one simple uh, pull takeaway? Yeah, I like the sound of that. <laughs> okay, good. We can close for today. 